a lot in the same way that I would be pitching a potential homeowner to manage for and some of the things I was having to tell the seller, property manager, just really explaining that, um, you know, I've been doing this for a while and I have, you know, good performance to show with review ratings. I take care of my guests. I take care of my homeowners. But then also telling him, you know, what are the next steps and kind of changes I'll be doing. And a lot of it has to do with the mastermind that... Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Real Estate Law Podcast. Jason Muth here with Straightforward Short-Term Rentals and Pride Away Stays. We have attorney Rory Gill. Rory, we're talking to another operator of short-term rentals. We're going to Nashville, uh, and we're going to be speaking with a friend of ours who runs Nashville Stays, and I love his story. Um, you know, We're going to hear about how he built this business up. Uh, and some of the speed bumps along the way he built through acquisition. We haven't talked to a bunch of people on this podcast that have that have uh, acquired companies and learned a lot along the way, right? We haven't talked to anybody who made that a cornerstone of their growth. And what's kind of exciting and maybe confusing for our listeners about this topic is that there are lots of different ways to grow by acquisition. Uh, mm -hmm. What that means really varies. You could buy relationships, you can buy properties, you can buy companies, um, and there is no boilerplate way to do this. Um, this is something where every little detail gets negotiated. Um, so I'm interested to hear his story and to see exactly how he grew his business in Nashville. Yeah. Uh, we'd like to welcome Eric Lewis to the podcast. Eric, uh, this is, I just learned it's your second podcast you ever recorded. And I see you on coaching calls all the time because we're in the same real estate mastermind. I saw you in person in Miami a couple of years ago. I would have never thought this is just, you know, podcast number two for you. You're so well spoken on camera. Welcome to the yeah. podcast. Yeah. Thanks. Glad to be here. And yeah, trying to, trying to get my feet wet. I'm not really camera shy. I'm <laughs> definitely a people person, but when it comes to the podcast and really encapsulating the story. I enjoy getting to sit down and talk shop. It gives my gives my wife a bit of a break. She gets the she gets the download every day. So it's nice to talk to peers before she gets the brunt. Your new wife also just got married. Yeah, that's right. Back in September. Congratulations. Still getting used to the new hardware. Yeah, I know, right? Daily. You know, once once that ring gets on your finger, it's been, you know, we're recording this. This is it'll be 10 years for us later on this year. Um, I finally got used to it, but I actually do take my ring off every night. I just put it on my glasses really? so I don't lose it. Yeah, you know, just you know, so to give my finger a little bit of a rest. Some people just, you know, never do that. But I don't Rory, do you take your ring off at all? Um, for when I'm at the beach, I'm in, at a pool, at the gym, yeah. I don't uh, playing softball. I take it off for things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'll you'll find the right rhythm, Eric. You might be comfortable swimming with your ring on or not, but um, yeah. so Eric is the uh, founder and owner of Nashville Stays, and if you look on the website, uh, it's NashvilleStays.com, right? That's right. Yeah. You'll see the properties that Eric owns. Uh, you'll learn about his business. Um, and you know the the avatar for who he serves is very different from who we serve uh, here in the Northeast at some of our properties. Um, you know, I'm going to be in Nashville. I'm going to see Eric. Actually, I will. I will have seen him when this comes out because we we have a big conference coming up um, in just a couple of weeks. And you know, I did get a short term rental in Nashville last time I was there. And boy, it is a very different market from the Northeast. Yeah, for sure. It's it's certainly more your, you know, if you think Nashville, most people think the woo girls and the bachelorette trips and bachelor trips. And that's true. And we do cater to families as well. But um, it really is kind of that exciting. We, we try to keep a good mix of still welcoming families, but we can't turn our eye to the fact that people are coming to go get rowdy on Broadway. And, you know, mm -hmm. we we certainly don't foster the party home, but we try to keep it fun and exciting for them because while the majority are traveling, but yeah, I saw a few of your listings, you know, clearly no parties, no smoking in them, but you know, they're very brightly colored. Some of the design is just out of this world. And I want to get into that um, a little bit later, you know, with memorable experiences, but you've had quite a run these past couple of years. Um, why don't you tell everybody your story as to how Nashville stays came about um, and, you know, when you started doing some work in short-term rentals and have evolved it into, you know, the larger business that you're running today. Sure. Yeah. So my journey started back all the way in 2020 when I purchased my first, uh, my first home. That's my only home, but first one too. Um, 
and decided I would short term rent that, you know, just go out of town for the weekends and really just fell in love with kind of hacking my first purchase and uh, really fell in love with it then. Uh, at the time, still in my day job, I'm a licensed CPA and auditor from previous um, corporate life. So really just did that on the side and did that for a few years, picked up a few friends as co-host clients, but really small, organic, not really leaning into it, not really the bread and butter, um, but really built up the experience there. And then just word of mouth, I found myself with about seven listings um, at the time operating under overnight Nashville brand, um, still with the day job. Fast forward to last November, I was actually laid off from that job, but luckily enough had enough of a kind of head start with the side hustle to go full time with it. Um, from there, picked up a few more listings. Um, but then really, like you mentioned, through acquisition was really able to explosively grow here back in September by purchasing another company, Nashville Stays, that we've adopted their branding with um, for another additional 10 listings. So really from overnight, more than doubling. Um, it was really just, you know, again, the same way where I was house hacking and paying my mortgage just by traveling on the weekends. I also realized you could do years worth of organic lead generation. But if you find that one lead who's already got those 10 spider webs of connections, it's really a quick way just to, you know, assumed credibility, you're you know, technically paying for it, but for him to trust me as the purchaser to take care of his homeowners, um, it really is just a shortcut that it's, I'm really glad that I listened to enough podcasts and had heard of it happening before to be comfortable uh, going into that really new transaction that I'd never taken part in. But You, you know, Eric, you're not the first corporation to buy another one. Right. So that's a really smart way to grow. That's how a lot of companies grow because you reach a limit with the organic growth, you know, in terms of revenue or additional properties. And sometimes the way to grow is to acquire. Um, and you must have had that foresight somewhere along the way. You said you listened to some podcasts that that talked about it. I do know a couple other people in our mastermind and some other folks in in the business that actually have done the same exact thing where they grew dramatically through acquisition. Talk about that process though. You know, you had your seven and then how did you come about finding another company, which was Nashville stays at the time that you didn't own that was interested in selling to you? Yeah. So it, I honestly credit it to my organic networking and marketing the same way that I came about getting those first seven listings and the way that I go about learning and growing is not just the daily podcast in the ears that certainly happens, but just meeting people who are a few steps ahead of me. And so by doing that, I met this gentleman who had a lot of really cool listings and more than I did. And he was a real estate agent. So he you know, had more of that sales and I wanted to learn from him. So I simply invited him out to coffee. This would have been a year before the actual business purchase happened. And again, I'm always Mr. Podcast and always have nuggets to share as well. So even though he was far ahead of me, there were some technical things or just things I saw differently that I could provide value to him. And since he was ahead of me, he would actually send me some leads for one-offs that were too small for him. Uh, they were too small for me at the time too, but still goes to show that just providing that value, I knew it would come back and I didn't really go into it with a transactional state of mind of what will I receive back if I can tell him these nuggets. But it really just organically turned into, um, you know, we hadn't been in contact much, but he would start texting me a month apart. Hey, you still doing the short term rental stuff? How's it going for you? And finally, it started to kind of tell like, you know, he wants something here. Um, mm -hmm. So scheduled a coffee with him and he let me know that he's ready to get out and focus more on the real estate part. And since, you know, he always liked my growth mindset of trying to learn and what I already brought to the table he really felt comfortable to um, be a serious buyer and that also it wouldn't be, you know, a lot of these co-host clients of his are his real estate clients and continue to be. So if he just handed them off to Joe Blow, who does a horrible job, you know, it's going to hurt his relationship as well. So really just by having that background from just organic networking at first is how it came about. Um, 
as far as structuring the deal itself, we very much were just shooting from the hip on that. Um, I think I had the most knowledge as far as I've heard people doing this on a podcast. I've heard of this. So these are the certain things we need in place. Um, and then just started networking and calling some advisors I'd heard on a podcast. They deal with the larger guys, like the 100 plus listing acquisitions. Um, and I just kept calling his office. Like I was below the minimum for him to he- him to even pick up that job. But I kept calling his office saying, hey, you're in Nashville. I'm in Nashville. Can I please pick your brain? Well, by the time I talked to him, we already have all the structure of the deal in place. And he basically confirms like, wow, you, you kind of spitball that really well. That's some of the things I would tell you, but make sure to keep these things in mind. But mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, I, I know we, we spoke before we went, started recording. Um, so I know how it more or less how you, you structured it, but there are just a lot of different ways that people can buy um, another comp- company, especially these companies that are where the real asset or the relationships. Um, I've seen people just have simple referral agreements on their way out. People have um, purchased the relationships um, and have a whole bunch of different ways, but you actually bought his company. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So I purchased the whole LLC that he was operating under, becoming that controlling member. So each of his co-host contracts that were written to Nashville Stays LLC, they're basically then, you know, assigned to me, if you will. And that was a lot of the legalese that we were really unfamiliar with is, you know, is this contract assignable and how do we need to even draw this up? And me taking over the LLC ended up making the most sense we think um but really at the end of the day too no matter what relationship you set up for the transaction you still have to have those homeowners buy in because unless you have a 12 month binding 12 month cancellation period if the homeowner doesn't want you they're not going to keep you and vice versa so no matter how it's legally drawn up i think that was a bigger consideration too was you know, speaking to these homeowners and giving them that confidence that they'll be taken care of. But then it was nice to know that we did have sound legal structure as far as there's now a contractual obligation. Mm -hmm. Um, And with the co-hosting, it it probably is a lot less messy than your traditional business purchase with heavy assets. Um, This was essentially the contracts and an existing relationship with the cleaning team that I contractually agreed to keep on. Um, probably one of the, probably one of the missteps of the whole deal was doing that without, you know, fully vetting, you know, I was too worried about getting the deal of, can I purchase it? Mm -hmm. Not do I want all these pieces with it? Um, yeah, it was interesting to navigate. No, I mean, since the real value that you purchase are kind of the relationships with the customers there. And much like when people buy out real estate brokerages, um, sometimes that the sale may go through, but the existing end client has their allegiances, not to the company per se, but to the people. And if the people change over, there's a risk that they're going to walk out. Is there anything that you built into your contract, your deal to protect you um, from from bad retention after the turnover or uh, or people going elsewhere? Yeah, for sure. So from what I learned to be the typical model when purchasing a management company is you do have a clawback period where you agree upon a price on the strike date, you're going to give them a check, but then you have that contingency period. And that's exactly what we did. So um, I did a probably, I think 50, 50, maybe a common arrangement with the larger ones. I gave a little more upfront just because I was excited for it. You know, going back, I'd change some things of the the levers. Um, but that's what we did. We had an amount up front and then a certain amount of time. I believe we did four months kind of retention period of if, Hey, I'm Eric. Hi, Eric. Here's the door happens. Mm-hmm. Then I'm not having to pay for those. Um, right before the deal went through, we found out one of the houses was actually hitting the market to be sold, which also put me in a weird position of, you know, I'm valuing these at what they're worth to me for a year, basically. And now I know this one can be gone as soon as title can do the paperwork. So that one, we actually increased that contingency period to be a year. So now it's an interesting scenario of, I know it can sell. We're going on four months right now. If we get to month 11 and it sells, I got the year's worth of revenue and don't have to pay for it. But again, this was all minded with 
you know, keeping these clients for at least three years to really make it worth it. So hoping that um, that real estate stays as expensively listed as it is and stays mm -hmm. where it is. But And I mean, is there anything that was baked into the agreement to protect the seller um, for, you know, his reputational uh, relationships he has with them in his other business, but also to make sure that you're doing your due diligence to keep these clients on for that, that earn out year? Yeah. So I actually was thinking about that because very much it was framed in the vision of what if the clients leave me in this new transition? And we really didn't put much in there as far as, you know, of course I'm going to do my best. I just paid money for these contracts, but we really didn't put any protection on his end of what if I just like negligently, you know, life happened to me or something. And I decided I didn't want to do this anymore and put them in a bad position. We really didn't. So that's, that's something I was thinking of as if, you know, if I'm hopefully selling 10 years down the road is to making sure that there's protections on both aisles and not having those blinders of this is normally who needs to be protected in this part of the contract when most times it's going to be both ways. So after you closed on the deal, how many of those contracts that were part of Nashville stays are now still part of your company? So of the 10, we ranked them in revenue and kind of the PETA factor. It's the pain in the uh, mm -hmm. pain in the rear factor. And number 10, the one who never wants to pay to replace broken blinds has never painted the house and the lowest revenue. We always said, if that's the one that goes, we hope it goes. We hope that one does. And sure enough, I got that phone call like towards the end of the escrow period of, Hey, I got bad news. Well, actually good news for you, Eric, but this one client has left. So it, um, that reduced the purchase price and I got rid of a headache. So it couldn't have worked better, um, for the one that did go. Right. And the others you retain. So you're still managing those properties. Still managing those properties. And one of the owners has actually purchased the second home that's been put into the management. So lost one of the bad ones and got a good one. But yeah. What are some of the strategies to introducing yourself and um, getting some loyalty from the people um, who, who are, came over in the transaction? Yeah. So a lot in the same way that I would be pitching a potential homeowner to manage for and some of the things I was having to tell the seller, property manager, just really explaining that, um, you know, I've been doing this for a while and I have, you know, good performance to show with review ratings. I take care of my guests. I take care of my homeowners. But then also telling him, you know, what are the next steps and kind of changes I'll be doing. And a lot of it has to do with the mastermind that Jason and I are in, the short term rental secrets. Um, really just that next level of coaching and, you know, your everyday operator won't survive now with the super compressed market of Nashville we have. So really the above and beyond things that I'm constantly elevating and leveling up in is something that really helped the homeowners be comfortable that they're not just getting a new manager. They're also getting some perks like my VA with 24 seven, you know, guest and owner communication, some more accounting portals and basically a more robust, um, you know, trust accounting can be scary to the homeowner who just gets a statement each month, but giving them more real time reporting. And instead of searching the emails for last quarter's report, actually having a central place to go do it. Um, and just basically anything I would be pitching a new homeowner with, you're basically having to reset that with them because that's exactly what they're getting is a new property manager relationship. Mm -hmm. You said you bought your first place in 2020 or your only investment. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. You, you just sound so wise beyond the years of having done this for just a handful of years, which is astounding because you did this on the side for a couple of years. We did it on the side too. We It was our side hustle from what, Rory, 2016 is when we bought that first place till I would say 16 to 20 is our side hustle phase. And then after 20 was the, the professionalization of it. Yeah, no, I mean, we were professional for th those other years. <laughs> like we certainly weren't taping things together and, you know, just not treating our guests well. And we'd 
the reviews to show. But to your point, yeah, I mean, like, I worked a professional full time W two job until twenty twenty two, shortly before the conference that um, that uh, I first met Eric at in September of twenty two. But you know, those last couple of years at that job, we were you know thinking about this transition, you know, when it was going to be. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm thinking if your first place was. I mean, not even four years ago, really. Depends on when you bought it, 2020. And and now you're how now you're able to speak to this level. You know, it shows how all in you've gotten and really how refined you've probably brought your mindset into the uh the operations of your business. T talk about when you felt like you were actually that you knew what you were doing. Like when along that way. It could have been day one, you know, like pound your chest. I'm proud. I, I know this stuff or it could have been somewhere along the way. Like what was that, that, um, evolution like? Yeah. So probably two different phases of kind of maturing. So doing it on my own house for over a year, you pretty much see all the different curveballs that the guests can throw at you, the different things that can go wrong with the homes, um, really getting my feet wet there. And your last podcast guest has, name escapes me, but I was listening to some of that. And he mentions being the worst employee that his last <laughs> boss had had had. I don't know if I'd go quite that far, but I literally am always listening to a podcast about real estate or short-term rentals. And it's been that way for years and years. And it's just always been where my heart is, but it also like just conversationally, I think that's helped a ton where it wasn't an overnight thing. It's just day after day of literature basically um so pairing that together with getting to run my own house as a short-term rental that gave me the confidence to talk to any homeowner of here's what to expect here's what i do to make all those kind of headaches not your problem and how i handle them so really after the first year i think was that you know maturation point whenever we talk more enterprise and being a professional management company for a long time, it was, you know, I feel like I'm just a good property manager, not necessarily a great property management company. However, once I was able to go full time, that certainly helps in my sales pitch to say, this is what I live and breathe. This is what I wake up and do every day. But it's not just a sales, you know, tactic to say it's really true. Whenever this is the day in, day out, like what I do to bring dinner home, that really just gave that second level of confidence and continuing to invest in education and being in this mastermind group, I'd say was, was the next part that makes me comfortable in front of any room. Um, it was a large investment to join that, but the education and peer space of getting to be in the room with like our coaches, for example, who they would go to Congress and talk short-term rentals just to see that confidence exude in them, um, I think really mirroring that and just trying to follow in those footsteps was kind of that next that next level. And and to be completely honest, after I purchased the business, it's a constant theme that I tell my wife, like what I just did there felt easy. Not in like I'm not growing since, but like I always think of if just the everyday, like someone with a regular nine to five punches out, surely they would pull their hair out at what I just went through with ease there. And after the business acquisition, I think that was a specific example where people in the coaching calls are interested and want to learn from me to hear in that. And that's just rocket fuel for my own confidence to know, like, you know, I did do something difficult and I am knowledgeable on this. I, I need to act and to be that. And I think it really just helps from a mindset perspective to, you know, to really believe it and feel it. Yeah. And think back to when you were working in that W2 job and you said you got laid off in that position. Did you think that this was going to be the next thing for you? Like, were you already at kind of one foot into this world? I know you had your one property, but was there at any point a decision that you were going to go look for another job doing the work that you were doing? Or was it like, nope, this is my next thing. I'm all in. Yeah. So I only had seven at that time, but luckily the revenue from even those seven plus the one house I owned I had to sit down and do the math with the severance package and what my kind of outlay for future revenue was. I did have to, you know, that was kind of a nervous exercise, but we're talking the day I got laid off doing this. Mm -hmm. 
And before I called my wife, or that is now wife, to let her know about that, I waited till the end of the day not to, uh, you know, worry her while she's at work. But by the time I called her, I realized that not once did I start to go, you know, go on monster.com or get the resume ready. And instead it was, you know, make sure I have the numbers to support this, but we're doing this. We're going full time. And this was before the business purchase was even, you know, a twinkle in my eye, if you will. But even then I knew that this was going to be the jumping off point that, you know, the business purchase really helped financially. Like you know, I wish that came sooner, mm -hmm. but never was going back to corporate an option, not because I hated working just because I knew that this needs to be the start of the next chapter. And that, you know, not to like sound corny, but this needs to be the first day of the rest of my life. Like mm -hmm. it was, it was always day one. Um, you know, you could not answer this if you don't want to, but talking about the purchase of a company that had, you know, these, these 10 contracts, you know, how do you do that? Like, did you get an SBA loan? Did you have money saved up? Is it owner financed some combination of those things? What, you know, what, what did you do and what kind of advice would you give to other people that are considering this? Yeah. So mine was a mixture of my own funds saved up as well as a private loan from someone in my circle. Um, and I was admittedly, I got really great terms of, you know, a few years of interest free with a five-year term to pay it off, but on a 20-year amortization, knowing just, you know, that this person has bought in to the same idea that I'm telling him here is that, you know, this is a big stepping stool. You know, I hope to do this multiple times, but I want to show you how powerful this can be and them recognizing okay, yes, but you're still an entrepreneur just now out on their own. You're not going to be, you know, raking it in the very first year from this purchase. So they gave me some runway with the favorable amortization period, just really as confidence that in the same exact way that I had to convince these homeowners that I'm the right guy, that I'm going to take care of them. It's doing the same thing to convince my wife, to convince this private money lender to convince myself like it all boils back to that confidence of having the education and experience but once they buy in then they're playing ball with me and it it really opens up to um what's possible in the future opposed to your traditional i made a few cold calls got a co-hosting lead then we started you know one at a time like that to really see pulling pulling together who you know and you know what's at your fingertips it's just a great way to multiply, but mm -hmm. long form answer. <laughs> uh, talk about the support that you received or did not receive from your fiance at the time, uh, you know, when you told her that you were planning on doing this. Yeah. So um, referring to staying full time or the purchase, the purchase uh, and, and going full time, both those, those are two big decisions. Yeah. So really for both of them, I think part of the maturing process I've had to go through of switching from, you know, a six figure W2 that's, it really allows me to, you know, have a steady income now that I'm full-time entrepreneur with flow seasons and heavy seasons, my income does this now. And that's something that I never had to specifically address when I had the six figure nine to five job. She's never had a variable income and instead has always been the W-2. Her father is an accountant, you know, retired early, saved a ton, like just very traditional, not go for the few big knockout swings like I do to build the business, but builds it slow over time. So it was really a framing of mindset to showing her, we will still have the traditional comfort that you're used to from an income standpoint. Like here's the projections for my house I own. Not many things can take that away from us. That's our baseline. Here is what happens if we perform 25% to our projections with our current clients only. And really just breaking it down to her where, of course, I can tell you the 10 years from now goal and what it all looks like when I'm all said and done. But I really had to break that down for her to show her that there are stepping stones to get to that path where maybe if it wasn't a relationship, or someone I had to communicate all this with, sometimes I'm bad about, you know, just knowing it all works out in the end. Mm -hmm. So it was really, really helpful to have to 
you know, convince her because I think a lot of that are things that I need to be remembering as happy go lucky Eric just charges into the horizon. So when you were laid off, you had the seven contracts or you had your, your yours and then the six that you were managing that was in place already. Right. Okay. So if you were not let go from that job, would you have grown that um, one by one? Would you have looked to acquire a company like you did? I think maybe if the purchase comes my way, it still would happen. But I was, you know, there was a lot more left in the tank where I could have kept the nine to five and still just slowly one by one added those contracts. And I think that would have just been a shame if that's what happened. Like I was continually bumping up to that edge of not giving my all at the nine to five because I'm just with seven properties running around crazy. So it was really starting to kind of redline what I could do to juggle both. But I think I sadly would have done it for multiple more years. So had the layoff not happened, I think I would have just stayed the path. And I think it would have severe or uh, significantly expanded my timeline of what I've been able to do. Yeah. You know, we when when my job ended, we had two live. A third was about to launch. A fourth was being built. Like we, the hammers weren't swung yet, but a couple weeks later they were. And then the fifth we didn't know about. Those are the five that we own. I look at it now. I don't know how I would have worked in that position with these five. You know, it just, I, I, I think it would have been impossible. It, I mean, like granted, there are some weeks that are heavier than others with the work that I do on the properties. And you could probably attest to that. But you brought something up about, you know, how giving it your all, right? Like how much how much would you have been able to devote to your position? And, you know, some people, we kind of went through a period of quiet quitting, right? That was a term the past couple of years. Uh, I've heard lots of people working remotely for two companies at the same time, not telling one about the other. You know, we've read those articles where you could make bank, but you're kind of doing a disservice to each company. There is a degree of like fairness to our employers, right? And the people that we worked for and they hired us to do a job. Um, and you know, if you're listening to this and you're in that job and you are trying to find your, your side hustle and make it your full-time thing, you know, I, I think there's a, a moral obligation that people have to people that are paying a full-time salary. I always felt that I gave it my all at my old company. You probably did too, but there was that, that strain on our time, right? You know, there are those phone calls that happen during the nine to five where you're like, oh man, I got to deal with this, but I also have to deal with this. It's a struggle. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I think I read an article where someone had three jobs, like you mentioned. I was impressed <laughs> by that. But no, it it, it was true. I mean, it, it luckily set set forward kind of the growth path I needed to be on anyway of, you know, hiring an assistant and really formalizing to really see just how much I could do with that nine to five job still. But it's just impossible to not get that phone call or to have to call a plumber back during the work hours where, you know, I wouldn't say I was like a horrible employee and not earning my salary. I was earning my salary, but it was very clear that I had no trajectory there. If I was going to keep, you know, one hand here, one hand here, how could I go 100% in one direction if I'm literally being drawn between the two? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, a good transition point away, you know, had it been my my decision was going to be later on the year of 2022. That was was really my plan. I've talked about it on this podcast. Um, but, you know, they just beat me to the punch by a couple months. Uh, but I already had it in place that I could replace what I was earning with what I was already earning on the side with our properties. You know, the beauty of working the full-time job and doing that is you're kind of double, right? You know, you have all that income coming in. You know, yeah. so when that ended, I had to build that back up with the other properties that we brought on and we managed to do that last year, which is great. Like my my goal number one for my first full year of doing this, which was 2023, was to get back to that level, replace all of that income, add it to what I already had, and then have that all in number, regardless of expenses, but have the all in top line number be what I, where I was. And I surpassed that, which is good. So, you know, I've kind of made next goal in my head for this year, you know, for the next level up. Um, you know, we I have so many questions I'm going to ask you in Nashville, not on this podcast, but just about building a building a business because we launched this, Broadway Stays. Can't really see it. 
Uh, but that's serving Provincetown, you know, with short-term rental co-hosting. Something I said I was never going to do when I joined this mastermind. You know, they ask us questions like, what are your goals? What do you want to do? Where do you want to be? You know, and I said, I just want to operate my properties, meet people and learn how to do it. And then here it is a year and a half later and I'm doing what you did. <laughs> I think it's yeah. infectious, right? Yeah. No, it's the, I think it's the fishbowl syndrome too of, wow, I've got a nice spot here until you see you're placed in that next fish tank and it's just yeah you grow you grow to meet the environment that you're in and i think a lot of my path was the same as you mentioned you know i was able to recoup that 9 to 5 income level a lot thanks to that uh business purchase but now it's got me to the point where it's okay great i met that arbitrary goal now it's how can i really streamline my lead process my sales funnel my onboarding all these things that are just prohibitive to me to do all these things myself, how can I build the team out, build the process out so that I can really now have my next ambitious goal that, you know, I feel it was that first goal of replacing that nine to five income. It kind of matches that it's, this is the money I myself was making. How can I myself make that amount of money being a property manager to where now we're able to take that next step to how can I now make enterprise property management company level incomes and growth and to really elevate out of myself because it's not my nine to five to replace anymore. Now it's the company's bottom line and the company's total portfolio. And it's just really exciting to get out of that individualist mindset and now see it as the company that it is. Yeah. So what what's the direction? Where are things headed for Nashville stays? Yeah. So a lot of what we're doing is a lot of what I've just mentioned there is really just solidifying all of our processes that we have in place and really building out the team um, where previously I've gotten away with, you know, a VA that is my, you know, task oriented type assistance, elevating even that to being really like an operations manager role to where it's not just here is deliverable I need, but it's actually running some of the day to day and taking some of the actual um, org organizational type tasks away from me so that I can focus more on acquisition and look ahead to what's next, whether that's individual properties or purchasing more properties or purchasing more companies. Um, once that first one's under the belt, you know, it really frees you up to see what's for sale out there and, mm -hmm. you know, how you can go about it and what to do different on the second time around. Um, before we get to a couple of the final questions, I want to ask about some of the places that you know, you have as part of your portfolio. Um, you know, it's it's startling to see the design of some of them, right? Did you have your hand in any of those? You know, really kind of memorable experiences that bachelorette bachelor parties might you know want all the Instagram pictures. Was that the owners uh, that had those designed that you took over? You know, what what is that design relationship like that you um, you know that you have now with the people that you work with? Yeah, so the the kind of marquee home that you're thinking of is the ten ten house. If I had to imagine, it's the top of the uh, website Nashville stays that comes up. That was one I actually inherited with the purchase, and um, you know, luckily that home is owned by a professional athlete that spent hundreds of thousands on design. But it shows too. Um, now that I have a portfolio of some that need lots of improvement, I would say to some that have the Instagram worthy at literally every corner of the house. And it's right next to downtown. Once you can see that gambit, it really makes it easier to pitch and show you, okay, you're, you're here on the scale of houses. We have to at a minimum be designed like this. Or if you want to go all out, here's an example in my portfolio. Here's what it's doing. Absolutely balls to the wall designed. And it really is great to see kind of what, makes a short-term rental tick in this market. And it doesn't have to be the 110% like the 1010 house is. It helps. But it certainly shows you that you can't just be, this house is as nice as mine. I'll stay in it on vacation. If you're not going to be fun with neon and aim towards the bachelorettes, you better be luxury enough to say, I'm going to stay in this house that is far nicer than mine at home. That's like the bare minimum. But to really survive in this congested market, you do have to stick out. If someone's scrolling on that page, they need to see that first picture 
click it and mm-hmm. book it before someone else does. Cause there's just so many options out there, but I could imagine operating in a market like Nashville. I mean, there's thousands, right? Like how many short-term rentals are there? Yeah, I think there's like 30,000. Don't, don't quote that. I can air DNA it, but, but I know the growth looking at the air DNA, the growth of how many listings have been added. It just, it goes like this. Yeah. I yeah. mean, what, one of my markets, there are 12. I own three of them. Right. Um, oh, literal 12. 12, 12. I'll, sh- I'll wow. have to show you. Yeah, 12. Although Air DNA says it's like a 95, you know, in terms of score. And I'm like, no, that's because of me. Like, stop <laughs> telling everyone that this is a great market to invest in. Um, another market has like 350. Another market has just over 1,000. Those are the three that we're in. Um, wow. So like 30,000 is unfathomable to me in terms of how to like stand out and compete. I mean, the 12, I will say, if you look at the state of New Hampshire altogether, you know, there's probably thousands throughout New Hampshire, but, you know, just in that one town we're operating in, you know, and if you add the neighboring towns, you know, you're not going to come anywhere close to 30,000. And those 30,000 are probably, I don't know, within what, a five, 10 mile radius of downtown Nashville. Yeah. And just pulling up air DNA quickly, I'm seeing like 10,000. So I feel like I way overshot that. But anyway, using 10,000 is the number Right. So majority of those are just right inside the downtown circle of Nashville. And they have to be too. With that many listings and if someone is clicking Airbnb, they're going to see the airport and the city center. If you're one that's sprinkled up here, yeah, it's, forget you're it. just you're not competing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I encourage everybody listening to this to check out NashvilleStays.com and learn more about Eric and you know all the great properties you have and, and the great work that you do. We could probably go on for a long time talking more about operations, but we'll save that for another podcast. You know, after you've had, you know, after yeah. you're an in-demand guest on others, we'll have to get your attention and you can come back later on this year. Um, but but let's let's ask the questions that we ask of all of our guests in this podcast just to wrap the interview up and learn a little bit more about you. Um, these are the same three questions that we ask everybody. The first one is if you can get on stage for a half an hour and talk about any subject in the world with zero preparation, what would that be? Zero preparation. Well, I'm not, I'm by no means a professional golfer, but it's very much a passion of mine. So I'd say either golfing or there's a, there's a podcast radio show. It's the Bobby bone show. Mm-hmm. It's another one of my guilty pleasure listens. Um, I listen to the, podcast replay of it every single day and my wife catches me mentioning my friend bobby and she'll stop me and say wait are you talking about the radio show with the people you've never met so i would say golfing with the bobby bone show would be i I never so i i worked in the radio industry and the media business for decades you know that was kind of like where i was before all this and i never met bobby bones I, i met a lot of the national syndicated um personalities that that work at iHeart and he's I believe he's still at iHeart um because that shows I think it's still syndicated here in this area I don't remember but um yeah, yeah. He, he he had a pretty pretty um dramatic rise to fame I guess 10 15 years ago where they they took him national so I think yeah. he's still on TV too um second question we have for you is tell us something that happened early in your life or career that impacts the way that you're working today I would say maybe two part. So during university, uh, doing accounting courses, you really have everyone come in and cram down your throat that public accounting is what you have to do and get your CPA license. My corporate career didn't follow that path. And I got my CPA license for the safety and the job market it would expose me to. But without going through the grueling public accounting route and going more private and like internal audit type roles. Um, And I found myself arriving at the same companies and positions that everyone who did work those 60, 70 hour weeks in the big four public accounting route, they went through and put their, you know, dog gears in. Yet here we are ending up at the same position on the kind of proverbial graph of employment. So that basically opened up my eyes to, you know, have a goal, know where you want to head in a general direction, but don't be afraid to break away from the norm. And what I'm doing property management right now, talk to a lot of my friends in the corporate life. 
it kind of sounds like I picked up a hobby and they really don't understand the implications of, you know, how powerful an opportunity it is to own your own business and to be working for your own time. So not being afraid to go against the grain and just go against the status quo. I think from a young age, starting at the early corporate life is something I've taken with me. It, it's really tough for people to understand what you're doing and fathom it if they are in that path, right? They got their degree, they got an MBA, or they got some other certification. They're five, 10 years into their career. What they know is just to work for 30, 40 years and retire, right? So like, if, if you haven't had that that aha moment that there could be a different pathway, it's 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 tough for them to relate. I've, I've just seen it also. And what you're doing, what I'm doing is not for everybody, right? I mean, sometimes you do it out of necessity. Sometimes you do it because you really want to become an entrepreneur, but there's nothing wrong with working for somebody and then working your way up in multiple companies for your entire career. And if that's kind of the mindset, and that's, that, that is the common mindset, right? That's what most people do. Yeah. So it's normal. It's, yeah. It's normal. It's, 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 it's hard to understand a different pathway and the people that understand that, I think that either they challenge themselves to look for it, um, they finally have that moment that clicks, whether it was forced upon them or they were looking for something else. Those are the people that you can see they start dipping their toe in the real estate meetups and they start dipping their toe and asking those additional questions of, of what you're doing. I get them all the time now where I'll get the I want to pick your brain question. You could tell that they're curious. Right when you get, I want to pick your brain, Eric. Yeah. Uh, final question. Tell us something you're listening to or watching or reading these days. Anything in the world? Yeah. So I'm listening to a new Audible. Um, I call it read. I tell my wife I'm going to read at night, and then she sees me pop in a Air AirPod and cheat with the Audible. But it's um, 10x is easier than 2x. Uh, it's a Dan Sullivan book with some young whipp whippersnapper Benjamin Hardy reading it. Um, but the whole premise of that book, it's really speaking to me. The kind of premise of it is the two X to keep doing what you're doing today. Yeah. You could stay up late and do it twice as hard if you want, and you can reach your two X trajectory that way, but going 10 X and really questioning what you're doing and how you're doing it. And it's a lot of the 80, 20 principle. They talk about getting rid of that 80% of things that you do in your business and your life. And focusing on that 20% of what really moves the needle to grow in factors instead of just doubling. Um, and it's really been speaking to me, just making me question some things that I'm doing in my daily routines with life, but certainly in my business. And I see that it would be hard to keep pounding the pavement as I am now versus really getting rid of those, um, you know, not as high value add tasks and really focusing on the kind of CEO and business owner um, functions that, you know, the role is designed for me to be doing. So it's been powerful. Looking forward to finishing that book, but more so uh, putting it into practice. That one right there. If you're, there you if, go. You're, if you're listening, you don't see that I'm holding up to the camera right now. I think that, you know, it maybe the peer pressure of a lot of people talking about this book lately in our group uh, has us all listening to it, but it's probably a good exercise. Yeah. Um, I'm not as far into it as you are just yet. Uh, and, you know, I look forward to listening to it probably after this recording, because if I show up in Nashville and I have not listened to this, I think that I'm going to be shamed at one that has, right? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to wonder what everybody's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hey, listen, this has been a great conversation, Eric. We really appreciate all of your time today. I think you're doing a stand-up job with the work you're doing. And, uh, you know, the the pathway looks amazing. You know, you have a lot of clarity. You're operating really well. Um, you know, you speak so highly about this industry and about the work that you're doing. I think you've put together a great company. And we're looking forward to seeing what the next steps are with Nashville Stays. Um, so thank you for being on the podcast. Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. I think it's a really good pulse check on myself to see where I am. And I look forward to continuing sharing your journey and mine and yep. uh, touching base about where we've gone from there. Yeah. 
And uh, if if you've enjoyed this episode, uh, you know, please share it with a friend who is also looking to either buy a business, build a business, get another W two job, learn about the pathway of of anything we've discussed. Uh, I think there's some great, fantastic lessons, um, specifically from this conversation. Uh, we love five star reviews. If you want to drop us a review or a comment, um, you know, we read all those. If you'd like to be a guest in the podcast, uh, please head over to realestatelawpodcast.com and fill out the form and we will be in touch. Uh, so on behalf of Rory and Eric, this is Jason Youth. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>